welcome everybody that's joining us via the internet or video or however you're watching this. Thank you. Uh, as always, we have a way for you to ask questions in, and we'd love to hear from you. Just email us at foundations at lifeoffaithchurch.org. And as always here in the class, please, please, you'll get more out of this if we talk with one another. And then y'all please help me remember I need to, I've been asked over and over again that when that happens, because we don't have a microphone here, make sure that I re-communicate the comment or the question for the sake of the video till we can get our technical stuff worked out. <clears throat> but in this class, we're talking about how to study the Bible. And again, we're not talking about that we're going to create a life of faith approved way of Bible study. Okay, we don't want to do that. You, you need to engage in your own self and your own personality and develop your own system and style of personal study because that will uh, get more out of it. It's kind of like um, we were talking earlier, Miss Gail and I, and uh, you know, the question of is what is the most effective piece of exercise equipment out there? Anybody want to dare to answer? You willing to do it? Yeah, wh wh whichever piece of equipment you use, yeah. right? <laughs> so so which, whatever is the piece of equipment that you'll actually buy and use, that is the most effective. So what is the most effective way of studying your Bible? Whichever way you'll actually engage and do it and study and all that kind of the same thing we say, what is the most effective translation of the Bible? Whichever one you actually regularly, consistently pick up and study and read, that is the most effective one. So we're not trying to dictate, if you will, a way to study, but what we do want to do is begin to give you tools that will help you study. So during whenever I'm here in this class, uh, please, again, as always, feel free to shout out, okay? I'm going to bring something um, to help us move along in this thing. But if you've got a question, a question about Scripture, something you saw, that's how we're actually going to help you learn how to interpret is We'll be able to practically insert your, your, uh, the principles of Bible, if you will, interpretation in a practical way. Same thing for you online. Email that in to us. We'll be glad to answer it here in a class whenever I'm teaching, and that'll be great. But when we start here, I want to start as a bit of my version of an intro back into looking at then why do we study the Bible, right? Why do we get engaged in studying the Bible? And in reality, it's because we're asking questions about life, right? We're always asking questions on what about this and what about that. And for us as believers, we always come back to what is the answer for our question, I want to go better help me out. This would be a real boring morning. So we're, we're studying. We have a question about life. You know, Miss Lori has, well, what about X blank? Fill it in. And if I'm a good Christian saint, I'm going to say what? You're going to fill it in. I'm going to fill it but, but from where? I'm going to fill it in from? The there you go. There we go. It's not, I'm not hard now. This is not trick questions. Okay, don't. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to fill it in. Hey, dear. I'm going to fill it in from Scripture, right? I'm going to fill it in from, okay, well, Miss Lori, the Bible says. But how do you know what's the next question from there? If you're talking to someone maybe that is not a Christ follower or they're not someone, they're going to say, where? Is that? where? But they're going to say, how can you trust the Bible? Right? You know, so because we're going to come and we're always going to give a great answer right out of the pages of Scripture. But as we're helping people and leading people and guiding people, they're probably going to say, but well, how can I trust that's right? Yeah. So how, I'm going to throw that out there because y'all looking a little funny here. How can we trust scripture? If I was to say, well, Miss Lori, you know, you just gave me a great answer. How can I, how can I trust that? How, how do I know? Well, I know it's like, okay, well, I have no idea what that means. So, and it's the infallible word of God. It's the infall How do we know it's infallible? That the Holy Spirit inspired it and wrote it and wrote it. Well, those are good. Those are good questions. Well, good, good job, Miss Gomez, because the Holy Spirit wrote it through men. Men wrote it. You know, that's one of the big questions that come up from critics is, is well, we can't trust the Bible because men wrote it. You can't trust anything like this because it was written by a man. Right, men wrote this, and I, and I, and it's always one of those again funny things. You say, well, then man, I should have known that during math class, because all of those little rules and formulas were written by men. And so when the teacher marked my question wrong, 
how could she do that because a man wrote that? Do you see? So just because a man writes something doesn't mean that what was written by that man is untrue. But we have to know bigger than that, how can we know we have confidence in Scripture? Because we're going to go there for answers. We're going to study out answers from Scriptures. But we have to know that it is, and I agree, it is infallible. It is inerrant. There are no errors in Scripture. It is trustworthy. But how do we know it's trustworthy? It's been proven over the ages. It has it's been proven over the ages. Does this make sense? Because again, what other answer? You know, how can you, you know, Brother Guy, how do you trust? Why do you trust the Bible? How come? Timothy 3.16, mm-hmm. Scripture is God-breathed. Is God-breathed, that's right. And God doesn't lie. He can't lie. He can't lie. But then if you talk to unbelievers, they're going to yeah. say, well, God doesn't I lie. <laughs> I just don't believe that. I mean, you know, you mm-hmm. talk to unbelievers, it's going to be hard to convince them because they're like, but man still wrote that. So but, that's your version of what that says, you know. And you give them your testimony of what the Word has done in your life. Good testimony, yeah. you know, they may believe that. They may be. Well, and, they, and I always goes to it next, right? Is because then I was, well, you know, again, I heard one preacher say it like this. Well, I, I tried it and it worked for me. Mm-hmm. That's kind of one of the, we have to be careful with that in our day and age we live in today because today experience is king, right? It's true because I lived it. Therefore, it's true. Does that make sense? And, and we have to be careful with that because that leaves a big hole in, in logical arguments for us because that's the same reasoning that other people, like the, you know, I know you guys and Eric and them that are here, you know, they used the 12-step program in the past, you know, and maybe they didn't know Jesus, they didn't have a higher power, but in one of the steps you're supposed to find a higher power, and so they grabbed their cup of coffee and said, this is my higher power. You know what I mean? And they put their, and next thing you know, they haven't taken a drink in 15 years. So they tried the coffee and it worked for them. (laughs) Does that make sense? And we have to, because now granted, we will have experience, but I'm trying to help. And these are just, I'm trying to have fun. Okay. Y'all all right this morning? Have y'all had your coffee? Have you worshiped the coffee? But, uh, uh, (laughs) but it's this, you know, what we're wanting to do though, is come in so that we know, as Peter said in his first letter, that we might be able to give an answer to all who would ask us, why is there hope in you? And all of us, when we have that answer or a question asked to us in one way or another, why do I have hope? We always come back to scripture and say, because the Bible has said, I read, as you said, brother guy, I read Timothy 3.16 and all scripture was inspired by God. But I want us to help as we begin this class to talk about The fact that we can trust this word, these scriptures, as inerrant, infallible, provable, livable, trustworthy from God. And now I'm going to not take credit for this. I'm going to put my own self in this, but this is actually a message that I heard from a man by the name of Dr. Vody Botkum. It's his his definition, and we're going to break it out, but he said it the best that I've heard ever. So I can't try to reinvent. I mean, I don't always reinvent the wheel, but this was just awesome. So where we're going to go in second Peter chapter one, and we'll start in verse 16, but here's the definition. How can we have confidence in scripture? Why can we say, this is why I choose to believe the Bible. This is why I have hope in scripture. And here's, here's Vody's definition. He says, because scripture is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses in the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, and they report supernatural events that have taken place in the fulfillment of specific prophecy, and they claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. You want me to say that again? Yeah. Yes, okay, good. Because it's a great, so think about it, okay? Just think about this. Why do we choose to believe the Bible? Because it's a reliable collection of historical documents. It was written by eyewitnesses in the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, and they report supernatural events that take place in the fulfillment of specific prophecies. 
then they claim that what they have written is divine and not human in its origin. Now let's look at 2 Peter, because this is where that definition, and I love what Dr. Bauckham says. He says, I can't take credit. I stole it. I stole it from Dr. Vody. Dr. Vody stole it from Peter. Because this is what it says right here. Chapter 1, verse 16 of 2 Peter. For we do not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father glory and honor when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So let's break this down this morning. Everybody doing okay? It's good. Now again, y'all, you'll, get, you'll get more out of this if you talk with me, okay? If we engage in, in this kind of stuff. So if you have anything. But look at this. Again, we have a reliable collection of historical documents. Peter says, we did not follow cunningly devised fables. Okay, this is not, Peter and them, they were not proponing myth. Again, many of the critics, that's what they say. Oh, all the supernatural stuff was added later, right? It was put in the scriptures at a later date to make it sound more spectacular. Peter says, no, 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 that's not, we didn't do that. We didn't bring to you cunningly devised fables. We brought you accurate historical data. Look over at Luke. Can I keep your finger? I'm going to put my bookmark here. Keep your finger. We're going to bounce back and forth from 2 Peter there as our text. But look at Luke, the first chapter. And you can go ahead and look at Acts. Again, for fun, and I encourage you, there's no way in just this short time we have this morning that I'm even going to scratch the surface on this topic because we've got so much to do. You're going to, and I encourage you, you're going to have to do a lot of study on your own. But it's fun. And it's well worth the energy and effort to research these kind of things. But Luke is the most historically accurate book that we have in Scripture. They're finding every day more and more. There's over 23,000 archaeological sites that are proving and have proved the historical accuracy of Scripture. And a lot of that coming out of Luke, when we look at Luke stuff. I remember when my mom and I in the early 90s, we went to Israel on one of those Holy Land trips from Cathedral of the Cross. I remember Cathedral of the Cross here in town way back in the day. And Pastor Mark Carell took us and led us over there. And during that time, there was a, a little bit of a discussion about Pontius Pilate. Because for so much time, people had said, oh, well, that's Pontius Pilate was made up. There's no record of him in history. There's no written documentation of Pontius Pilate. He was, again, someone that they just added into Scripture. And about a year before we went to Israel, they found a mile marker. And guess whose name was on it? Pontius Pilate. And it was basically in kind of Brad's vernacular. This was kind of like you know, that adopt the road sign thing. You know, you know this, this stretch of highway was <laughs> sponsored by, <laughs> you know. Or who, and so Pontius Pilate had sponsored this highway. And it was the Pontius Pilate. And they found and thought, oh my goodness, that he was somebody. Because the, here's the thing. Well, if, if they were detailed, let's look at this. And I'll, I'll say in my next comment. Look at verse, chapter 1, verse 1. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand... Notice I haven't said that, as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. Notice what Luke, he opens his letter by saying, you know, there's people out there and lots of people are writing about what has happened. He says, but I took it upon myself to start from the beginning as eyewitnesses of what was happening and put down to you an orderly, 
And one translation says a chronological account from the beginning all the way through of what happened. Right? So Luke, was he, was he being meticulous? Yes. yes. Was he just writing stuff to give us some bedtime stories for the kids? So if he was historically accurate, was history the subject of his book? Yes. Well, yes and no. I mean, that was a bit of a trick. Not really. Here's a question. Seriously. <laughs> but it's, y'all all right this morning? No, if Luke's history was accurate, his book was about Christ. So his book was a theological book. So if his history was correct, his theology was what he was after. He wouldn't lie about that. But listen to what it says. Verse 4 is the key. That you may know the certainty. Look at that. You may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. That you would know certainly that this is what has happened. Go, go to Acts chapter 1. Because Luke wrote both of these books. He did. Look at there. See? Awesome. I love it when we learn something new. Notice in chapter 1, verse 1 of Acts. The former account, now this he's talking about his gospel. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Now notice that. Many infallible proved what? His resurrection. Right? So the resurrection is a historically accurate event. That's awesome. So we can know with certainty being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So again, we have in our hand a collection of historical documents, accurate documents of history about God and His Word. It's the most accurate. Well, and here's what's, here's what's going on, because again, there's a lot of speculation that runs in and out of there, Right? And it comes that people talk about, we can't trust Scripture because it's not accurate. It's just myths. It's just fables. And that's, again, Peter says, no, no, we didn't bring you myths and fables. We brought you accurate history of things. Okay, we brought you accurate, and I, again, and people would say, well, you're using the Bible to interpret the Bible. That is one of the key ways to interpret Scripture, is with other Scripture. But again, we're not defending Scripture Okay, again, I like what Spurgeon said. Scripture can defend itself. Defending Scripture is like defending a lion. All you have to do is unchain the lion. <laughs> and the lion has no problem taking care of itself. But what we do want to present to people is why do I choose to believe Scripture? Because it is accurate, reliable, historical evidence. I feel like I'm not going to... That means, guys, our faith isn't a blind leap. Isn't that awesome? Our faith, again, a biggest thing, our faith in the resurrection is not a blind leap into things. It's accurate, historical, reliable information that we're putting our faith, our hope, and our trust in. Amen. Yes, sir. You ultimately have to make a choice. Uh huh. And believe. It's like a mindset. And yeah. I've had people that I've tried to witness to. Yeah. And share my beliefs, and they said, "Well, I'm a realist. I believe in living in the real world." Yeah. And they won't choose. The way, the way of life yeah. that Jesus prescribed. Yeah. Well, and, they, and, and you're right, Brother God. Brother God says, you know, that, that ultimately it's a choice. And all things will come down to a choice. Yeah. 
And I'll, I'll agree with that, and I think you had said that earlier. But the choice, again, most people, though, and this is why we enjoy this class, it's, this, this lesson's a bit to help us in Bible interpretation or in Bible study, but it's also to help us as we go out and share our faith with other people. Because how many times do we, when we talk about people putting their faith and trust in God, do we not present it as, well, you just got to make the leap, right? You just got to take this, I can't give you any evidence, I can't get you any support, I can't, I can't throw you a bone, you just got to jump out there and trust God. And, and people stand back and they go, uh-uh, <laughs> no, uh, That'd be crazy. It'd be, it'd be like saying, you know, brother guy, I, I got this bridge, right? And, and, and it's in Arizona. You want to buy it? <laughs> Does, you know, no, I got no pictures. Can't send you any, any, it's just, it's there, but it's there. It's a good bridge. Steady. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and yes, sir. Real Frank. Well, you know, to me, everybody got their own belief. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I believe in a nerd. Uh huh. Brother Jane believes in a yeah. nerd. Now I'm going to try to get y'all to believe what I believe. Uh huh. And you're trying to get me to believe what I believe. Yeah. But it just ain't going to work out that way. Well, that's a, it's a great. Uh huh. It ain't going to work out that way. I can't change his mind and your mind, and y'all can't change my mind. <laughs> so we all hold out there. <laughs> well, this is, this is a great thought. You know, that's a thought that we have in our culture. But here's, so here's again, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm, I don't want to interrupt. With the scriptures in this book, mm -hmm. you say all scripture is uh, written by the inspiration of God yeah. through the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Well, how can you say in John that Jesus came that you may have life and have more mm -hmm. fun? Yeah. And the thief came to destroy. destroy. Yeah. All right. If you go back over in the Old Testament, over in Job, it said, naked, I came out of my mother's womb, and yeah. naked, uh -huh. naked, how I come back. Very good. The Lord giving, and the Lord take away. Yeah. But yet, and over here in the New Testament, says that he came that you have more the life. life and mm -hmm. more abundance. But over in the Old Testament, the Lord giving, and the Lord take away. Now, that's causing confusion, right? Very good. Great question. Well, see, and this is great. Awesome. Thank you, Brother Frank. This is, and this is what causes confusion. So I'll go, I'm going to get to you. I, I'm remembering. Y'all got to help me hang on so we can say this. Uh-huh. If you read the book, please ask me. Mm -hmm. about the preacher man yeah. and chasing the wind and all that. Yeah. And get on down. Solomon says that the Lord dealt to him a bad hand. Yeah. That's right. So... Then one part, he said, you better off if you don't even come here. Yeah. No, understood. That's right. Why, 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 so let's talk about that because these are the questions people have, especially here. And that's, so there's a, lot, a big question that Brother Frank brought up and we're going to chase the rabbits as far as we can with the time that we got. Because they're good for what people say. How, the one first question was, is, well, I believe this, and Brother Frank believes this, and Brother James believes something else, and everybody's trying to convince everybody else of what they believe and get them over to their side. Right. See, and the issue we have, Brother Frank, in this is a mindset of truth. Where does truth come from? Right? Where does truth exist? Because in our culture at large over many years, Truth has been born out of experience. What I believe is real for me, so therefore it is real. And that is the source. Y'all mind if I, I'm going to teach you some big words, okay? It's all right. Don't be scared of big words. Big words are not snakes. They will not bite you. They will only help you. The big word is called epistemology. Everybody say epistemology. Epistemo An epistemology is the study of where truth comes from. That's all epistemology is. It's the study of where do we get truth. And in our culture, our epistemology, the study has shifted to experience. Right? It has shifted to experience is the source of truth. It is where truth comes from. Did you want to say something there? Okay, 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 I thought I saw a hand. Okay. Oh, it's good. No, you're good. Uh, you just taking up an offering? No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, um, is, um, but, you know, it's, it's where truth comes from. And so we have to come back and what we're helping people realize, and that's why we're covering this part, but there is absolute truth. 
that is existent. Whether culture wants to acknowledge it or not. Because even though we could say this, even like you said, Brother Frank, you believe something, I believe something, and James believes something, we can all be wrong, but we cannot all be right. See, that's the thing when everybody says the whole idea of all roads lead to God, right? All religion leads to the same destination. If you'll do a study, every religion can be wrong, but they cannot all be right. Because when you study their answers to what's wrong with man, how do we make what's wrong right, what happens when this is all over, we're all diametrically opposed from one another. When we talk about how we actually deal with what we deal with in the world, it's all in the opposite direction. The Christian believes diametrically opposed to the Muslim, diametrically opposed to the Buddhist, diametrically opposed. And, and, and don't write me ugly emails, okay? Because it's it, what happens, and I mean it, because what happens, well, they, they all talk about good. They may all, to a degree, surface level, talk about being a quote-unquote good person. But when you dig into the religions of the world and you actually look at how they answer man's problems... They are all opposite from one another. So again, they can all be wrong, but they cannot all be right. So we have to have something that we can ground our life in, that we can stand up and say, this is truth. And how do we prove something is true is what we're taught. That's what Peter was saying. What we have told you is not a myth it is not a fable. It was not a cleverly crafted story. It is true. How do we know it's true? And that's when it says, it was written by eyewitnesses in the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. Right? Brother James, go ahead. I'm holding on to your questions, Brother Frank, because they're awesome. I want to get to them in just a minute, so don't let me forget if we've got time. Yes. Mm -hmm. the word of truth. Yeah. So you can come up with a whole bunch of different scenarios. Absolutely. If it's wrongly divided yep. here and wrongly divided there and mm -hmm. wrongly divided, but there is rightly divided. Then it goes back to Absolutely. who's rightly divided. Well, <laughs> well, and, and, and when, okay, so great question. So the idea that we can rightly and wrongly, you know, Second Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God. It's going to be a whole other lesson that I'll teach in this class. Because the, the main dividing line that helps us understand Scripture is pre-cross and post-cross. Life before the cross, which is Job, Ecclesiastes. Life before the cross, life after the cross. You have to remember that Scripture is a progressive revelation of God through the man, Jesus Christ. So when we read older accounts, again, like you quoted Job, or we're talking about Job, Brother Frank, Job in its chronology is the oldest written book we have in Scripture. It precedes even Genesis and the first five books of the Bible. It is the oldest documented one. So it starts chronologically the story. So even though Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, here's another thing. Everything written in Scripture has been truly recorded, but it does not make what was recorded truth. Just, and that's what messes a lot of people up, is they go to Job and they quote, well, Job said, the Lord giveth, and they, well, yeah, Job said that, right? Job truly said that, but that does not make what Job said a truth. An example in the New Testament, when the Pharisees said, the whole world has gone after Jesus. That's an English phrase called an hyperbole, which is an exaggeration to make a point. Had the whole world gone after Jesus? No, no not at all, because they were not going after Jesus. So even though that was truly what the Pharisees said, they really did say the whole world has gone after Jesus. That doesn't mean what they said was true. Does that make sense? Same thing as what's going on in Job. Okay, again, Ecclesiastes. Even though we would sit there and say Ecclesiastes and Paul, or John, uh, Paul, John, Solomon wrote what he wrote in the book. We have to remember on one side, Ecclesiastes was wrote, written after a time when Solomon 
wasn't necessarily as coherent as he used to be. Right? And he was truly writing these things, and it was an expression of what was going on in him, but it doesn't mean that what was written was true. Yes, Derek. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and, and that's a good point, and that's an, and we're going to cover this too. That's the importance of understanding all context. That's important of when we read Scripture and study Scripture, that even though we may be focused in on a certain passage for some reason, we have to know where that passage fits in the actual context. I, got, I see you just hold on to it if you can, just a, just a little bit. Um, because it's, like you said, in, in Brother Frank, with John, in John chapter 10, when, you know, and we love to quote, you know, and the thief comes, but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life. And, and normally, who are we talking about in that scripture? Satan. Yeah. Do you know that Jesus is not talking about Satan in the context of that scripture? Okay. He is not dealing with demonic powers or evil spirits. Now, let me make, before my chunks me right out the church, and I have to go find a new place to go to church. Mm-hmm. You need to read it, and we'll probably cover that in some other stuff. It's in John chapter 10. But Jesus in context is not speaking about the devil. I do believe that we can apply it as a secondary application to that. But in context, Jesus is talking about false teachers, false doctrine. He's talking, if you remember in that story, he's talking about I am the good shepherd. I am the doorway to the sheep. And he's talking about people who would try to get to God on another pathway, another path religion, another doctrine, and trying to have access into God another way. He says, they come to steal, kill, and destroy. They, the false prophets, the false teachers, the false doc, they come to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come to give life and to give life more abundantly. So that thief. You have to read things in context, honey. Yes. So that thief was the deceivers. Was the not necessarily, and again, in straight context, please hear me, I think in, as an overarching biblical application, we could do a secondary, but remember that it's a secondary. They might be motivated by They might be, absolutely, they've probably been motivated by the devil. I, would, I mean, again, we could start now splitting hairs all day till, till Christmas time, right? And, but when we, when we talk about, again, being accurate in reading, it's, this is the kind of stuff we're talking about, to, to get into Scripture and what is the context saying but the main reason why is, is what we were saying, because it's truth. See, we're not dealing with just, again, our own, histor- our, our own theological, doctrinal, holy scriptures. We're dealing with, yes, that's what they are, but we're dealing with truth. That's what Peter, man, we didn't, Peter's my version of Peter, we did not make this up. We, we did not sit down and conjure up some new way of, we are telling you what happened. Go to 1 John, if you will, and look at that one. Because guys, if I could just hammer some of this stuff home, and this is why, this is, to me, as we cover this, is important, because it's this that gives us confidence in everything else. Yeah. But don't we need to get mm-hmm. to the bottom line of this? In what way? Yes, the what's the bottom line? The very bottom of all of this is like one person believes this, another. Mm-hmm. The bottom line of this is the convicting, convincing power of the Holy Ghost. Oh, absolutely. It's not our job absolutely. to convince who's right and who's wrong. It's the, whole, the work of the Abs- Holy Spirit absolutely. moving upon people. And if people really, to me, are not being moved upon by the Holy Ghost, you can talk to them. You're blue in the face. Yeah. And they may not ever, ever. believe what you Well, and, and so the comment was, is, is from Ms. Gill in the front, is, is the idea of, it, oh, we got three minutes to go. Okay, gotcha. I almost took go. Uh, we forget about it. Anyway, but uh, let's see. As, um, <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But it's, um, but it's this idea that we're looking at here is just that, is that the bottom line is, yes, the Holy Spirit is moving and working in the hearts of men. Right? And, and so we can, I can't change anybody. And again, even though it's good and we should talk about these things, and I want to help you with these things because of what, again, Peter said in his first letter. Because people will ask you, why do you have 
hope. You're probably going to answer them because Scripture, the Bible says, He came to give me life and life more abundantly. But I've seen so many, but you'll get stumped by people if you're not careful when people sit there and say, but yeah, but how can we trust that? And many times, again, our answers are, well, take a blind leap. You mean, it worked for me. I was raised that way. That's just what we've always believed. And we have to be able to tell people, no, because somebody, I mean, this is what happened with us in Canada. Because when we were in Canada, we were in a nation where, when I, I did an over, overarching survey of our church. And probably well over 75% of the church we had in Canada were first generation Christian. Meaning they were the first one, as they can remember, going backward or forward in their family's time. They were the first one to be a believer in Jesus Christ and their family. First one. Does that make sense? Yeah. And they're coming in and they have these, and I think our country is not that much far behind, even though we have a historically Christian background. And as we want to now go, because yes, it's great for us to learn how to study the Bible, and we will learn for us, but I'm not, I'm not learning to study my scripture for me alone. Right? I'm learning and studying my scripture for another so that, like you said, Brother James, so that I can rightly divide the word, not just for me, but so that I can take the word to the world and know that I have rightly divided it for them. So the guess Brother Guy, you had something. Uh, two things. They're teaching us in Bible college to look, if you're going to study the Old Testament, look at the Old Testament through New Testament eyes. Yeah, Absolutely. And that everything in the Old Testament is a type and a shadow of the New Covenant. Absolutely. And Jesus is in there. Yes. And the other thing is, in my prayer time, I asked him about witnessing. And he said, you don't have to be eloquent or Not at a all. Bible scholar. Mm -mm. Just tell them what I have done for you. Yeah. Well, and, and, when, here's the, and I'm not even talking about being eloquent, okay? Even though, I mean, I will... I, I endeavor to, if y'all get to know me, I endeavor to teach you from who I am, right? I want to challenge your thinking for your benefit, right? We, we as, again, if I can just be clear, we as a culture sometimes think weakly mentally. Does that make sense? So when I give you big words, it's not because I'm trying to be impressive, I'm trying to slap more weights on the barbell of your thinking so that you can exercise that way. Does it, and so I said that on one side, because I, I know what you're saying, and you don't have to be eloquent, and you don't have to present this eloquent, but I want you to know everything that is possible to know so that you can therefore then be simple. Does that make sense? Because the ability, the way to be able to communicate simply is to be able to think well and to think deeply. Because if you can think deeply, it's kind of like somebody, I mean, Melly is gracious enough to swim, they let us swim in her pool at her house. And, and y'all know or not, I can't, I swim like a brick, <laughs> right? So, so, so guess what end of the pool I get to live in when I go to her house? The two footing, I get the shallow end. That is as far as I can go because I can't swim in the deep end. Or you can't go floaties. I can go floaties, yeah, I can do that. But, is, but those of you who can swim, guess where you get to swim? You get to swim in the whole, not just in the deep end, you get to swim in the whole pool. You can go deep, you can go middle, you can go shallow, you can go everywhere because you have an ability to go to the deep end and back. That's the way we must think. People, if I can just be honest, people kick our spiritual backsides because we have dumbed ourselves down and we can only stay intellectually in the shallow end of the pool. Does that make sense? And we go out in there and they jump out in the deep end on something and we're stuck. And, and if somebody doesn't throw me a floaty, 
<laughs> you know, somebody didn't throw me a floaty and I got my little water wings on and I'm out there trying to, you know, converse with them. And, and, and again, like you said, and not to, that it's going to be my conversation that's going to convince them because it's only the power of the Holy Spirit that draws people unto Christ. But yet I am the vehicle that he has chosen. You are the vehicle that he has chosen for the people in your world to take the truth that is in this book and to be able to sit down with them. And when they come up to you and they ask you questions, about, well, what about Job? Well, 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 what about Solomon? From the, that, There seems to be this disconnect between what happened over here and the bigger one. Well, what about this God of the Old Testament that looks mad all the time and, and now all of a sudden there's Jesus and he's supposed to be all love and kind and you know, did, did God take his, his medication finally and, and flip over to the other side? I mean, because they have questions. And, and, and if I can say that, we are studying, and, and there's a twofold way, and i got to end on this one, right, Brother Chris? I'm out of time. Is that right? Yep. I am slap out of time. I'm sorry. Is, is again, because there's twofold levels that we're trying to, yes, I'm studying Scripture, and, and here's the dividing line, 2 Timothy 2.15, I'm studying to show that I have been approved by God. But then what does it continue to say? Because I'm a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. See, in that verse, Paul tells us why we study. I study personally to show me that I have been approved by God. But I'm showing me also that he has made me a workman for his field that has no place for shame to come no matter what my past was no matter what I did or didn't do or anything I am without shame before God and the world to take this gospel to the world because I have shown myself personally that I'm approved I've shown myself that I am a workman for him to take this out there rightly dividing the word of truth for who for me and for the world I'm rightly dividing scripture for two audiences I'm rightly dividing scripture for two audiences in my thing. Me and those who God will bring into my life. Does that make sense? Yes, and, and so that's why, and if I can do anything with this and inspire this kind of stuff for us, guys, this is why we get up in the morning and have devotions. This is why we get up in the morning and we feed our spirits. Because I'm, yes, I'm, I'm getting my slice of daily bread, but I can't eat a whole loaf by myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, I'm getting this for others because somewhere in my day, I'm going to bump into someone by the leading of the Holy Spirit who's going to have a question about God, about Jesus, about life, about the world, about what's going on. And I'm going to come and break the bread of heaven with them and say, well, here, here, and they'll draw life and it will be the next step in for them. And so that's why, again, well, maybe we'll see if we can finish what we're talking about. But we have a reliable collection of historical documents that are themselves truth so that we can stand on them as actual truth for our faith. Amen. Have a great day. Thanks for watching.